Hi guys. In this video, we will be understanding the relationship between population and the environment, looking at the role of the elements in the physical environment and understanding population parameters, finishing with an exam style question. So the first thing we're going to look at is the relationship between the population and the environment. And there are many facets of the relationship between these two elements that we need to understand. And these factors are also really important for understanding population distribution across the world. And this is something we're going to look at later on in the video, but it also implicates environmental impacts as well. So these are some of the issues we're going to be looking at in this video. So starting with features of the physical environment, these are things like topography, which is the shape of the land, the climate, geology, which is the rock underneath the land, and also ecosystems. These factors all come together to determine the nature of different elements in the environment and they determine things like the water supply, potential environmental hazards, soils and the drainage of the land as well. And these factors then go on to affect a lot of human factors, including things like food production. Obviously, if a land is more fertile, it's going to produce more food, also relates to energy supplies settlement plans and also human health and these are some of the factors we'll be looking at in the rest of this chapter on population and the environment but this is to give you a brief overview about how these physical factors influence human life as well and influence where humans choose to live in the world. So these human factors then go on to influence the population size distribution and success of the population in different areas and when humans therefore then live on the land, this can also have negative physical impacts on the environment itself. So it's almost like a chain. And this is to do with levels of resource consumption. If humans are consuming more resources than are present on the land, the resources will become depleted um, and so on. It also relates to standard of living. People in highly developed countries consume a lot more than people in low income countries. So this has a massive impact on the environment as well, because there's often more pollution in certain countries more than others. And also there are many mitigation measures put in place to reduce the environmental impact. So this isn't really an impact. This is that mitigation measures have to be created in order to deal with the impacts of humans on the environment. So there's a two-way relationship between population and the environment. The environment allows humans to sustain life, but also humans therefore use the resources of the environment and also end up damaging it in some ways. So the impact of increased resource consumptions by humans on the environment leads to things like climate change, and this is through the emission of greenhouse gases, which are causing global warming, Things like pollution, ozone depletion, which is allowing more UV radiation into our atmosphere. Because ozone is a molecule, we don't need to know about this, but essentially it reflects or absorbs some light from the sun. So with ozone depletion, the earth will get warmer. And also the depletion of finite natural resources, things like fossil fuels like oil, coal, gas and also other minerals and metals and also it leads to damage to wildlife as well through the destruction of habitats. Now that I've outlined the relationship between humans and the physical environment we're going to look at some of the elements in the physical environment more specifically. So the first thing we're going to look at is the climate and the climate is the most important physical factor influencing the environment and human populations and this is because climate factors such as rain, temperature, and so on, and sunlight levels too. They determine things like food productivity, so how much food can be cultivated on the land, and it also determines different farming systems. So for example, many crops may need temperatures of at least 5 degrees Celsius to grow, and so on. So plants and also livestock are very specific to where they can grow and so that's how the climate influences things like food productivity. Also high concentrations of population are determined by climate factors as well such as adequate rainfall and temperatures that are suitable 
for the growth of livestock and crops because obviously humans need to eat so therefore they will locate themselves where farming can take place. However, characteristics of the climate can also drive the level and nature of diseases. For example, in the tropics is where we find most of our diseases, um, diseases like malaria, yellow fever and Ebola. And this will influence the death rate and the life expectancy in these different areas with different climates. However, if you look at the example of the UK, we don't live in a tropical climate and we're probably living in one of the few places in the world where we don't suffer from many infectious diseases, as many as there would be in the tropics. Another factor relating to the climate is climate change, which I touched on a bit earlier. And this has been arising from global warming and It's the aspect of the environment that's giving greatest concern to human populations at the moment, at the start of the 21st century. And this is the battle that we're going to have to face over the next century and so on, is that the climate is changing and this is going to influence population patterns and it could lead to the scarcity of food and so on. So it's a real challenge that we're going to have to try and mitigate and also deal with. The next factor that we're going to look at is soils and this is obviously very much influenced by the climate itself and it's a very important feature of the environment as soil fertility will influence the amount of food that can be grown from the land as well because more fertile soil is the more plants and crops the soil will be able to support. So the factors that influence the fertility of the soils are things like the soil structure, texture, acidity, which is the relates to the pH of the soils, the levels of organic matter, and also the levels of nutrients in the soil. And these factors will all work together to determine the agricultural output and the type of farming system that can be employed on a certain piece of land with a specific type of soil. However, in the recent decades, Fertility has been able to be maintained artificially, essentially, not naturally, by the use of chemical fertilisers. And this has enabled high population densities to grow in areas of land where there wasn't traditionally very fertile soils. However, it's thought that this will lead to very unsustainable outcomes because fertilisers can leach into water systems and cause water pollution as well. So whilst fertilisers have aided the growth of human population by making soils more fertile, they're not very sustainable and they're not that good for the environment. Also, areas with fertile soils are often associated with densely populated areas, as I mentioned before. So we do find clusters of people living in specifically fertile areas. This is where we have volcanoes because volcanic lava and ash makes the soils really fertile. So if you look at a map of population density, you will often see high population densities in volcanic areas. Our next factor is water supply and you may realise this already but people need access to water to survive. Humans cannot survive without water, it's impossible. So the main reason why we need a fresh water supply is mainly for hydration but there are also other main key uses of water that we need to support human populations. These are for irrigation, for food supply Crops obviously need water to grow as well, so that's another big use of water. And some other key uses of water are for hygiene and sanitation, such as sewage systems, and also in industry, many chemical processes require water. So that's why water and the water supply is so important to supporting human population. So just like soil type, water supply also determines population distribution. And a key example of this is in Egypt, where the main source of fresh water is the River Nile. And 90% of the population of Egypt as a whole live within 12 miles of the River Nile. So they have a really high concentration of population density around the river, which indicates that water is really, really important, especially because Egypt is mostly a desert environment. Then the last factor that we're going to look at is geology and other resource distributions. And by geology, I'm referring to things like fossil fuels and also valued minerals. And these resources have aided industrialization, 
which has then gone on to aid development of countries. Obviously, we use fossil fuels for things like petrol, um, but also to produce plastics. And we always use valued minerals in everyday life. A lot of metals are used for electricity and so on. So as we can see as well, geology and other mineral resources are really important for human population as well. And often we'll find that the areas that have industrialised first are the areas where these resources have been in abundant supply originally. And it's led to a high population density because through development, this has allowed populations to grow, obviously through the development of infrastructure and so on. And that's why countries that were originally very rich in these resources, such as the USA, China, India, now have the largest populations in the world. And whilst these um, initial resources that they used to boost their populations at first are now kind of being very much depleted, their economies are still stable and still growing because now they've moved on to things like tertiary industries to kind of save and serve their economies. And now we're going to be looking at population parameters, having just looked at elements in the physical environment. So first of all, I'm going to define the two main population parameters, which are population density and population distribution. So population density is the average number of people living in a specified area and it's typically measured in people per kilometre squared and then population distribution is the pattern of where people live and it's considered at all scales from local to global and also in specific areas or countries. So if we look at this map here of global population distribution and density we can see that population distribution is uneven across the world and that's because if it was even, the whole world would be one colour. However, we have areas of bright red such as in India and China where we have really high population densities and also the white areas where we have very little or few people living at all. And you can see that population density varies within countries and also across the world. So... In America, you can see that population is mostly clustered around the coastlines, whereas we have this massive gap here where it's pretty much a very low population density in Western America, apart from at the coast. Um, we can also see a lack of population density where we would find deserts, such as the Sahara Desert in North Africa, also most of Australia, and then also in what are typically called deserts, but also the polar regions in northern Canada, Greenland, Iceland and also in northern Russia as well. So obviously, as you can see, overall the places that have the highest population densities are those which are most hospitable for humans to live. So they will have good water supplies, good soil fertility, whereas the deserts, which have very little water supply and also low productivity of the soils, they have very few people living there at all. So those are the physical influences on where people choose to live around the world. And now I'm touch upon the role of development processes in influencing population parameters. And the process of development has been a narrative that has been associated with the human ability to acquire and make use of natural resources. So the populations that have been able to make use of natural resources have become more developed and those that haven't remain less developed. So essentially, development surges have resulted from some trigger to the process. And most notably, um, we had the Industrial Revolution, which occurred in Europe in the 1900s and 1800s. And this allowed technological developments to take place. And with the development of technology, this then enabled specific areas to support larger populations. Development has also been aided by the reduction of mortality rates and the improvement of life expectancies. So this is very much linked to the control of infectious diseases. And through development, we have been able to control diseases with greater efficiency. And through reduction in numbers of infectious disease cases, this has allowed a rapid rise in global population. So this has been one of the main reasons why the world population has grown from about 1 billion in 1800s 
to 7 billion in 2011. And this rapid population growth and the process of development have actually had lots of negative environmental impacts. And the impacts of individuals will depend on where they live on the planet and their individual lifestyles and their use of resources and services and so on. So typically people in less developed countries have a very different use of resources and therefore they will impact on the environment in different ways due to their different levels of development. So to finish off this video, we're now going to answer an exam style question. And the question asks us to analyse and comment on the trends shown in the map below for global population density. And this is the map of population density we've got and we looked at it earlier on in the video. And it shows us population density and its distribution across the world. We can see we've got really high population densities in China, India and also in Europe. We've also got very sparse population densities in areas where the environment isn't suitable for human life, such as in the Sahara Desert, also in northern Canada and Alaska, and also Siberia and Australia. So essentially where we have the areas of white, these are mostly where we find our largest deserts in the world, whether they be hot deserts or cold deserts. And um, we can also look at the links between the availability of natural resources and population density with places like China and India having lots of natural resources to support very large populations. Also the reasons for high population density in Europe being the industrial revolution and the advances of development and technology facilitating the growth of a larger population. And this is the same in America as well, although as we can see, America's population is more sparsely distributed across the country in comparison to these areas in Europe and Asia, where we have a much darker red colour showing a much higher population density across the land. So the first thing we're going to write when we answer one of these questions where we're asked to analyse a map or a figure is to state the overall pattern. And so I've written, overall, the map shows uneven distribution of population density across the world. As we saw in the map, if the population density was completely even, everywhere would have the same probably orange colour. However, we have very stark differences between areas of high population density and low population density. So we can say overall the pattern is uneven. Next, I've gone on to talk about the location of very high population densities. So I've said high population densities tend to be located around the coastlines of continents as well as along major rivers such as the Nile in Egypt. This is due to water supply being an important factor for population growth. This explains the low population density in the Sahara, Australia and northern Canada and Russia which are all classified as deserts. So here what I've done is I've taken a pattern that I've picked out on the map which is the clustering of high densities around coastlines and also near rivers, most prominently being the Nile in Egypt, which we can see really stands out as a dark red on this map here, which is where the Nile is. So that's what I've stated. And then I've gone on to comment on why this is the case. And we learned earlier in the video that water supply was a key factor for supporting human population. So I've linked this back to that. Then I've gone on to state another trend. So I've said the areas of highest population density are in China, India and in Northern Europe. This is primarily due to technological advances and the availability of natural resources, which have enabled the growth of these populations. So once again, I've stated the pattern that I've picked out from the map and then gone on to explain why or comment as to why this is the case. And for these reasons, it's the technological advances in these areas and also the availability of natural resources. Hi guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you're looking for an amazing A-level geography resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. See you soon and together let's make A-level geography a walk in the park.